I'm in the heart of Manchester for a very special reason. But first, we need to go up there. I've been watching birds since I was a kid. And when I was growing up, there was one bird I always wanted to see. The peregrine. And today, slap bang in the center of Manchester, I've got a perfect view of a pair of nesting peregrine falcons. These peregrines have been nesting in Manchester since 2005. Last year, they raised four chicks, and this year they've got the same number. The big screen in Exchange Square usually shows sporting events, but at the moment, it has a live feed from the nest, so everyone walking past can watch the chicks every move. That's called a peregrine falcon. During the three-month nesting period, RSPB volunteers are here every day to help the public get a close-up look of them. You know what? I can't believe I'm sitting in the middle of the city centre watching peregrine falcons. They are essentially cliff-nesting birds, so the transition to living in cities, I suppose, is very similar because a lot of these buildings to a peregrine would seem like a mountain. And the reason they're doing so well in the city? Because there's never a shortage of food. There are plenty of these things for peregrines to eat. This is dinner, lunch, breakfast, snack, and maybe a little levensies. And the peregrine is perfectly designed to hunt them. With their ridiculously good eyesight, they can spot a pigeon from one and a half miles away. This is the wingspan of a female peregrine. Look at the size of it, massive. And traveling at speeds of up to 200 miles an hour, the pigeons barely know what's hit them. It's all over before they can say, peregrine! Paul Winter is one of the RSPB wardens who has been protecting these birds. How are the public reacting to this? Uh, the general reaction from the public is, is just fantastic. You know, they're, they're so surprised to see peregrine falcons in the city and, and equally they're very appreciative that we're here to be able to give them such great views. You know, we have the chicks on the nest, but also we can see the adult birds for a lot of the day as well. So the chicks are looking pretty bouncy up there on the screen, yeah. on that ledge. I mean, when are they likely to leave the nest? Well, it's the big question. Um, they're about four weeks old now and they'd normally fledge after about six weeks. So we're expecting two weeks' time that they'll be leaving the nest. And you can see even now they're, they're flapping the wings, they're building up their flight muscles, they're starting to raise a little bit off the, off the nest site there. They should be going any time soon. So once they actually leave the nest, where do they fly to? Well, the, uh, once they're off the nest, the parents will teach them to hunt around the city centre here for the next three weeks or so. So we should get brilliant views of the parents, maybe catching prey and dropping it for the young ones to catch and just teaching them the hunting skills. And then after they've taught them to hunt, the young birds will disperse and they could go anywhere, really. I think it's fantastic that these incredible birds are flying over the streets of Manchester. But how do the locals feel about peregrines hunting overhead? When it dives, it travels at 200 miles an hour. What do you think about that? Yeah. <laughs> I'd be afraid as a pedestrian. <laughs> I think it's great to see that wildlife is coming into the aftermath. I think it's fantastic, actually. I didn't know about it until today until I saw it on the screen. Well, that was a resounding thumbs up from the people of Manchester. I've watched peregrines all over the world, but as a kid, I never dreamt I'd be able to watch peregrines flying over a city centre. Fantastic. When I was growing up here in London, I always enjoyed a trip to the zoo. It was my chance to see exotic birds I thought I'd never get to see in the wild. Wow, look at that, that's a lilac breasted roller. Superb. And that literally is called the superb starling. And an African jacana. God, I feel like I'm in Africa. There's another bird I'd really like to see today. 
I can hear them chirping all over the place. No, not that one. Nor that. There it is. Okay, it's a sparrow. One of Britain's most common and familiar birds. And one that most people actually don't even look at. So why am I so pleased to see one? Because this bird, which was once so common in London, we called it the Cockney Sparrow, has now almost vanished from the city centre. In fact, just about the only place you can see them in any numbers is here at the zoo. It was a bit different when I was a lad. Tell you what though, the sparrow was the first bird I ever recognised as a kid because I used to call them baby birds before I knew they were actually called house sparrows. In fact, I've got a funny story actually. When I used to be a kid, I went to the hospital to see my sister when she was born. And basically, instead of going in to see my baby sister, I was outside counting sparrows. I had to be called in by my dad. I think my sister's never forgiven me for that. I feed the pigeons. I sometimes feed the sparrows too. It gives me a sense of enormous well-being. They're fantastic little birds, very cheeky. To me, they epitomise London. There are all sorts of theories as to why sparrow numbers have fallen elsewhere. But zookeeper Adrian Walls thinks he knows why they're still thriving around here. So Adrian, I can't believe the amount of sparrows in this place. I mean, they're all over the place. No, it's great, isn't it? I mean, I suppose the lucky thing with, with the sparrows, I suppose, is, is we actually feed a lot of the animals in the zoo by scatter feeding. And basically what that means is we, we throw the food everywhere within the enclosure. And the sparrows are quite opportunistic. And they're squeezed through the bars, they take the food, and they go back. So, you know, there's an abundance of food here for them, and, you know, they thrive on it. You always think of sparrows as cheeky chappies. Are they kind of cheeky here? Do they, do they land on people and nick their food and stuff? They, they, they certainly nick food. I mean, they're, they go and nick a bit of food from the gorilla. You know, they're not worried about that. You know, they go in with the vultures and steal a bit of food. You know, and they're just, they're just looking all the time. I notice that there's nest boxes all around. There's some behind you now. I mean, yeah. how many pairs breed in the zoo now? Um, in the zoo, we probably got... I mean, there's, there's a good four locations where, you know, there are large groups of sparrows nesting. I mean, the clock tower this, this building behind us is, is one of the favourites for the sparrows, and there must be over 40, 50 nest sites, you know, around the zoo. And also, you know, sparrows being sparrows, they they go to any of the old buildings and look for any nooks and crannies and, you know, go inside there and start nesting in there. And what do you think about sparrows? What do they mean to you? So, I mean, sparrows for me, I mean, I, I'm a bird watcher. I love going out watching birds. You know, every morning, you know, it's quite nice just to walk into the zoo, walk past the building, see the sparrows building nests, you know. As, as a child, I can remember lots and lots of sparrows around, you know, and I kind of watched them disappear a little bit, and it's nice to come to the zoo and see a nice, healthy, thriving population here, and it's, you know, we're, we're trying to conserve a species on the doorstep as well as species globally. I've really enjoyed seeing the bird that meant so much to me as a kid. I just hope that all the people who come here to see these beautiful, exotic birds take time to enjoy the good old Cockney Sparrow. If I was going to ask you where the seagull capital of the UK is, you'd probably turn around and say Skegness, South End, maybe even Blackpool. Well, you'd be totally wrong. It's not even a coastal resort. It's right here in Gloucester. There's an estimated 20,000 seagulls living in and around Gloucester. And for the people who live here, they are a real menace. Dirty, noisy, and often aggressive, they've slowly colonised large parts of the city. One of their favourite hangouts for food is the city's landfill site. It's one of the biggest in the UK, and maybe why Gloucester has so many gulls. Every morning, thousands gather for a feeding frenzy, then head back into town to annoy the residents. They're noisy, they're disruptive. I can't stand them. Mm, love them by the sea, hate them in the city. 
Oh, don't go there with me and seagulls. You hate Why? them? Yeah. Why do you hate them? Because my car is covered in seagull poo all the time. Can you see that? And that was one here, yeah? Yeah, I watched it. Like, I just cleaned the car. So your car washing in... bills are quite high? Yeah. Across the country, various tactics have been used to try and control urban seagulls, ranging from poisoning to using birds of prey to hunt them, and to find out how Gloucester is handling the problem, I've had to head up to the gull's domain, on top of a city centre roof. <laughs> In Alfred Hitchcock's famous movie, the birds attack humans for no apparent reason. But here in Gloucester, the gulls have very good reasons for some pretty aggressive behaviour. <laughs> Merrick Brentnell from Gloucester Gull Action Group has been taking and destroying their eggs and swapping them with dummy ones. And we've got a clutch of two there. That, those were put in there probably about a month ago, and hopefully they'll sit on, on the eggs. I mean, last year in trials, they sat on the eggs until August. And when the really? season, they're actually quite quiet. They're not, they're not a problem to anybody. There's quite a, an aggressive one over in the corner. On the whole, the tactic is working well. But while we were filming, Merrick spotted the last thing he wanted to see. Girls. Right, OK, now what's happened here, they've actually chucked out the, uh, the dummy eggs and they've relayed. There's so that, 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 that's, that's the problem. Yeah. yeah, so you've got a chicken, you've got two eggs. So yeah, that's really annoying, because obviously... So what do you do in this instance? Just leave it. But not everyone sees the gulls as the enemy. Peter Rock, the UK's only urban gull expert, is monitoring the gulls. For him, the key to managing them is understanding their behaviour. Well, we're going to have to get used to the idea that, that we're going to be living alongside girls, but we need, that's the attack call, by the way, but direct hit. <laughs> and do you know why they got you? Why? Because I'm wearing this coat and they think I've already been done. <laughs> well, it's a new design anyway. <laughs> in theory, the gulls shouldn't be such a problem in the winter as they go on their annual migration. Unfortunately, Peter has made a rather worrying discovery. 36% of adults have decided that going to Spain and Portugal, eating sardines and then spending the rest of the day on the beach in the sunshine loafing about is just not a very interesting thing to do anymore. Which is so sad for people of Gloucester. Well, they come back here and they spend their time on the rooftops. They've got the best nest sites and if they all start doing that, we're going to have gulls in town for 12 months of the year instead of just five. So it looks like our urban gulls are going to be as much a part of city life as pigeons. And you know what? We're just going to have to learn to get along. It's just gone seven, and I'm waiting for what I know will be an amazing, noisy wildlife spectacle. And here it comes. Incredible. It is absolutely amazing. It comes another lot now. And they still keep coming. Every evening, over 7,000 rose-winged parakeets roost in these trees. But we're not in the tropics. We're not in India. This is Surrey. Isha Rugby Club, to be precise. And these colourful and very sociable birds are absolutely thriving here. It's estimated that there's around 30,000 parakeets living wild in the UK. And experts believe that this will rise to 50,000 by the end of the decade. The vast majority of them are here in Surrey. And I've come to Bushy Park to find out more. I've been passionate about birds and wildlife since I was about this small. And despite living in London, I go bird watching every single day. I never switch off. But one thing I must admit to you is, I haven't really been paying much attention to the parakeets until now. There seems to be a parakeet in almost every tree, and they've been breeding here successfully since the 60s. How did these small parrots come to be here in the first place? Well, there are many stories, or should I say myths, concerning this one. The first of which, they escaped from the film set of that famous film, The African Queen. But my favorite one, imagine this one, Jimi Hendrix on Carnaby Street in the 60s. He has Adam and Eve, two parakeets in his hand, and as a peace offering, he lets them go. 40 years later, we have 30,000 parakeets. How amazing is that? The more likely but less exciting explanation is that they are descendants of escaped pets. 
They survive so well in our climate because in their native India, their range of habitat goes from tropical jungles to freezing conditions at altitudes of 4,000 feet up in the Himalayan mountains. To be honest though, I've never really been a keen fan of parakeets. I don't think they belong in this country. They're not British birds. They should be in India. But I think I'm in a minority in this part of London. What do you feel? I, I love them. I absolutely love them. They add a bit of uh, exoticness to the area, I think. I, I love them. And you love the noise they make, yeah? They're a little noisy, but it's, uh, it's a pleasant sound, yeah. So do you think parakeets are British now? Yeah, why not? Give them a passport, they can be here. <laughs> so the humans round here have taken these newcomers to their hearts. But what about the local bird population? These newcomers need nesting sites. They need to find food. And it makes you wonder, does this actually have a negative impact on our British birds? Parakeets nest in holes and crevices in trees. So do woodpeckers and so do starlings. I mean, take this tree here. That hole there probably belonged to a woodpecker once upon a time. Now, a pair of parakeets live there. As for their diet, well, it's remarkably similar to a vast number of our British birds. Buds, fruit, seeds, berries and nuts. They can also live to the ripe old age of 20, hence the rapid growth in their numbers. It's got some people so worried that a government survey has been commissioned to assess their impact on our native species. There's been mutterings about a cull killing off all the birds. Personally, I think it's inappropriate. I think it's way too late. Besides, too many people love these birds. I think now it's a case of learning to live with our new noisy neighbours. Because love them or hate them, I think they're here to stay. We know there are six million pairs of robin during the summer that live in Britain. But what we don't know is the amount of robins that actually are here during the winter. So to find out, we need to try to count them. To do this, we need to attract them to our gardens, which is quite simple. All we've got to do is put food out for them and make them feel at home. What robins love are mealworms. Um, it gives them lots of protein. You can get them dried as well, but if you can't get mealworms, you can always opt for hard grated cheese. I've got a bit of cheddar and edam here, just in case he has a preference. And there's always a trusty, crusty bits of bread. Brown bread is my favourite. All we need to do now is just wait and see if our robin turns up. Right, this is a bit where you need to be a bit patient because the birds don't come straight away. Sometimes it takes them a little bit of time to get used to the fact that the food is there and it's a safe environment for them to come down to eat. There's a few things in the tree there. There's a about five or six house sparrows, and the fact that they've come is a good sign. Oh, there's a cat. It's the last thing we need in the garden has just made all the birds go. He's eating the cheese. Shoo. Hey, there's some movement up there. There he is. Ah, oh, there's our robin. This one looks particularly shy, though. <laughs> he just landed on the bench. It's actually, he's taking a bit of work, brilliant. It just shows you that even after two hours, we can attract a robin to our garden. That's fantastic. For birders like me, the Norfolk coastline is one of the best places in the UK to hang out. This 100 mile stretch of coast sticks out into the North Sea and because it's relatively close to the continent, birds gather here all year round. There's two shovelers, a male and a female, and they're called shovelers because of that strange shaped bill they've got. And those wonderfully pretty avocets. They've got an upturned bill and they use to filter the surface of the water. And now there's a new visitor to these shores, the little egret. It looks as if it'd been more at home sunbathing around the Mediterranean. But over the last few years, climate change has encouraged these birds to explore further north. It was almost hunted to extinction in Europe in the 19th century because its feathers were highly fashionable. 
In fact, it was a large-scale killing of these beautiful birds that led directly to the formation of the RSPB in 1889. Now, not a lot of people know that. They've been making a comeback since then, and the first breeding pair in the UK was discovered in Dorset in 1996. Now, I'm very excited today because we've been given unprecedented access to a breeding pair. They've just hatched some chicks in a secret location and I'm going to help ring them. Jez Blackburn works for the British Trust for Ornithology and he's keeping a close eye on this rare and protected species. Jez, I'm really surprised that there's little egrets breeding in this bit of woodland because I always thought that they liked to be next to water. And yeah, you know, that's right, Dave. Although it is quite a good habitat here because we've got this dike running down the side of this field which is good feeding of small amphibians and small fish. We've got this wood here, which is low coniferous uh, plantation, which is ideal for them to nest in. To avoid distressing the birds, we've only got one hour to get in, bring the chicks down from the nest 30 feet up, ring them and put them back. So it's a real race against the clock. Okay, that's the case. Just put it into the palm of your hand. It feels so tiny. They're wow. about 10 to 12 days old. And they'll be in the nest for about six weeks before they fledge. I can't believe this. I used to run after these little birds 20 odd years ago when they were really rare in this country. And now I've got one in my hand. This is the closest I've ever been to a little egret. So what do you do now then? What's happening now? Okay, well I'll put um, these two back into the bag for, for the time being. And then we'll ring the one you've got in your hand. Look at that big gape it's got. And some fancy hairdo as well. The original Mohican. So Jez, why do you need to ring the chicks? Right, OK. Well, this bird is ringed with the British Trust for Ornithology metal ring. It's got right. a, a unique number. This will be able to take more information, such as the ringing date, the time, the age of the bird, the condition of the bird by taking the weight and other measurements. And this can all go onto the BTO's database. Will that hurt the uh, no, this, egret this in any ring, way when it's growing up? No, this ring won't hurt the bird at all. Now, it can move freely, as you can see. It won't drop over the foot or go over the knee. And basically, it's just like you or me wearing a, a, a wristwatch. Yeah. We can also put uh, colour-coded plastic rings on the bird, so then we can identify the bird once it's fledged. Yeah. And in turn, all of this information can then help us estimate population and survival, give us an idea of where these birds are going to, yeah. and seasonal movements, for example. I think my little friend's taking a liking to me because he just won't let go of my fingers. Do you want to come home with me? Does it look quite healthy in your it's hand? It's looking very good, this bird, yeah. Well fed, you can see right, his yeah, belly's yeah, quite yeah, fat nice there. plump belly there. Adults have been providing a lot of food to it in the last few days. Stuffed full of fish. These little birds bring a touch of the exotic to our country all year round. And for me, at least, that's a very welcome sight.